Sermon number 38 from True Love Chapel, based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is an online Christian video preaching and teaching ministry. Um, we've been following the ESB Study Bible Reading Plan. And um, I've been giving these uh, sermons, these weekly uh, online sermons. And, um, you know, we, we have some discussions and commentary going on within stuff. There's a blog up at uh, truelovechapel.com. Make this the year that you decide to dig in and, and study the Bible. I mean, the year is almost over, but it's not too late to get started. You know what I mean? And uh, this is going. Uh, this is going out September twenty fifth, two thousand sixteen. Um, ordinarily, I am preaching out of the New Testament uh, portion of the plan, but there was a little bit of a curveball in the in our plans, and uh, ended up doing some of the Old Testament. We had Daniel and then Ezekiel, and then we'll be back into the New Testament after that. Ezekiel's a pretty long book. Um, but we're in Ezekiel today, chapters 9 through 16. And, uh, you know, by the way, thank you everyone for who's been uh, putting up comments and answering the discussion questions and stuff. Uh, that's, that's really, uh, oh, excuse me, that's really uh, helpful and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I really value the feedback and that we're getting and um, in case some, anyone has noticed I have uh, decided to sort of combine two of my websites I have obviously I have truelovechapel.com and then there was another one called sevensound.org the number seven the word sound and then dot org and that was a uh, that was from years ago um, it was uh, a ministry of Christian electronic music, electronic dance music, EDM. But it was using the, for the lyrics, it was just spoken word of Bible verses set to electronic music. Kind of a, kind of an evangelistic tool, you know, to, to get the word of God out in places where it might not have been heard otherwise, you know. Uh, or just make it easier to listen to for some people who, you know, are, are into that kind of music and stuff. But um, it was hard to keep up with uh, so many websites. So it looks like I'm going to be combining those websites and uh, just transferring the Seven Sound stuff over into True Love Chapel. So that's what's going on if you've noticed on uh, YouTube. We had the album The Parables of Jesus which was a Christian drum and bass album in uh, English and Chinese. And, um, yeah. But uh, anyway, back to Ezekiel. Um, you know, and it's a process too, f figuring out the, the websites and stuff, what I'm going to do, kind of play it by ear. Uh, we have until, until New Year's, I think, to finally decide to shut down the old website or whatever we'll figure that out the important thing right now is Ezekiel so we're gonna be looking the reading assignment had us going from Ezekiel chapter 9 to chapter 16 and we're gonna be looking at chapter 11 Ezekiel chapter 11 and uh, let's pray Almighty God thank you God for uh, for being you know for being who you are God that you are um, that you are love and that you are forgiveness and kindness and mercy and grace and uh, we thank you for that God we need that so much we need you God and please be with us in our Bible study and um, help us to learn from your word and uh, open open our hearts to learn from you we pray in the name of Jesus amen all right Ezekiel chapter 11 let's read it um, he's talking about judgment on wicked counselors okay 
Uh, it says, uh, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the house of the Lord, which faces east. And behold, at the entrance of the gateway there were twenty-five men. And I saw among them Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatea, the son of Biniah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and who give wicked counsel in this city, who say the time is not near to build houses. The city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say, thus says the Lord, So you think, O house of Israel, for I knew the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in this city, and have filled the streets with the slain. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Your slain, slain who you have laid in the midst of it, they are the meat, and this city is the cauldron. But you shall be brought out of the midst of it. You have feared the sword, and I will bring the sword upon you, declares the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst of it, and give you into the hands of foreigners, and execute judgments upon you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in the midst of it. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. And it came to pass while I was prophesying that Pelatea, the son of Benaniah, died. Then I fell down on my face and cried out with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, will you make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Okay, we can stop right there. Um, any questions? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what's going on here? Well, Ezekiel is in Babylon. He is in exile in Babylon. And he did not physically travel back to Israel to see what was going on there. But he saw what was going on through the Spirit. So Ezekiel is prophesying. He is having a vision of what's going on back in Jerusalem through the Holy Spirit, which is showing it to him. And um, basically what was happening is some of the Jews in uh, Jerusalem were planning to rebel against the Babylonians. As you recall, Babylon had conquered Israel and Judea and they um, exiled, you know, many of them, the Jews, and transported them back to Babylon um, to try to break up, you know, their, their national identity and all that. But actually all of that was a punishment from God. God was actually punishing Israel and Judea. And God was punishing them for their disobedience, you know, then allowing the Babylonians to to take over and just take them captive and all that. And um, so back in Jerusalem, some of the Jews there were planning to rebel against the Babylonians. They were going to fight back and try to free the exiles and just try to take over um, try to regain their their country you know regain control of their country and to get the exiles back um, that was their plan and then some of the there were there were these false prophets that rose up in Jerusalem and um, they rose up in Jerusalem to tell them what they wanted to hear now what did they want to hear what they wanted to hear was that they would be victorious, that they would be able to defeat the Babylonians and set the captives free. Um, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, of whom there is a book in the Bible, 
Jeremiah is in Jerusalem at this time. He was not among the exiles. He was still in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah was telling them not to listen to the false prophets. Do not listen to them and do not rebel against the, the Babylonians because you won't be victorious. Um, doing that, you're only multiplying the number of slain, the number of dead bodies that they're going to be over this whole or ordeal. Um, you will, he's telling them you will not be victorious if you try to fight the Babylonians now. Don't do it. Um, so Jeremiah was the true prophet of God, giving them direction. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to listen to the false prophets. And in fact, Jeremiah was accused of treason simply for telling the truth. The truth hurts sometimes. They didn't want to hear it. Um, they wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. And when the, Jeremiah was telling the truth, they charged him with treason for testifying to the truth and for being a true prophet of God. They, they didn't want to hear that. And, uh, and Jeremiah was imprisoned by Zedekiah, the king at the time. Okay. And then false prophets in uh, Jerusalem, they were sending word back to the Jews in Babylon, and they were telling them not to build houses for themselves there in Babylon because supposedly they would be set free soon. So telling them don't, you know, don't get too comfortable there. Don't don't bother building houses there. We are about to be freed. And you know what? Ezekiel, he was in Babylon and he was telling the Jews that they should build houses, that they should settle down uh, and build houses and live and get comfortable there in Babylon because they're not going to be freed for quite some time. And it was in, it was 70 years, in fact, as prophesied by Jeremiah. Same as we had been discussing last week. So the, the exile was for 70 years. And, um, and again, Ezekiel, he knew what was happening back in Jerusalem through the Spirit. The Spirit showed it to him in a prophecy, a, prophecy, a vision, a prophetic uh, vision. He did not physically go there except through the Spirit. Okay, so with that... With that little background, we'll start working our way through some of these verses here. In uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, well, in the beginning section here, in verse 3 actually, it says, uh, Who say, The time is not near to build houses. The city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. Well, what does that, <laughs> what does that mean? What's the cauldron? The cauldron is uh, it's like a pot, a metal pot. You'd put it on a fire, right? Like if you're cooking something. And then, so the city is the cauldron and we are the meat. That means the city is, is their protection. The city is the cauldron. It's the metal thing around you, protecting you from the fire, right? On the outside. Now the meat eventually would get cooked. I don't know if it's a perfect analogy or what, could, but it would take time though for the heat to to get into the pot. So initially, that that's offering protection. They're saying that the city, um, this this city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. All right. Weird saying. I just thought I would point that out. It seems foreign to us today, uh, this sort of manner of speech. So just to give you some clue what they might be talking about there. Um, in verse 6, you have multiplied your slain in this city and have filled its streets with the slain. Um, and it was, it was the false council that was multiplying the number of people slain. It says, filled its streets with the slain. Their rebellion, it was their rebellion against God that got them into the, this situation in the first place. And then, rather than listening to the prophets, I mean, like I say, it was a, it was a very turbulent time in Israel's history with the exile and all that, with being defeated by Babylon and being exiled. This, the, the nation was broken up to pieces, basically. 
So the people were devastated. Well, God, you know, in his mercy and grace and divine providence, God provided prophets to speak with them. He has Jeremiah with them in Jerusalem. And then he has um, Ezekiel and he also has Daniel. They're both in Babylon. So, I mean, they were not left without prophets. And uh, they're telling the people what to do. And at that point, it was to wait, to just, um, you know, to expect the exile is going to be 70 years. It's not going to be less than 70 years. It's, that's it. That's the exile. Don't start a war. Don't start a fight now because you're just going to lose. And, but they weren't listening. They, they wanted to rebel. And it was just causing more people to be killed. Um, which is furthering their punishment. You know, they're, they're in the mess in the first place because of disobedience. And then they, don't, they still don't listen to God to God's direction and they want to do things their own way the way that they think is right um, instead of listening to God there's a there's a lesson in there somewhere I'm trying to put my finger on it you know <laughs> no seriously there's a lesson in that you know it, it's like the sooner you can start to obey God the better and it's going to get a lot easier for you. And you're just going to keep running into problems the more you try to fight against God and against his plan. And um, down to uh, verse, verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10. You have feared the sword, and I will bring the sword upon you, declares the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst of it and give you into the hands of foreigners and execute judgments upon you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, in verse 10, judge you at the border of Israel. This was um, the border city of Riblah, which is where Nebuchadnezzar stayed and judged the captives as they were brought out from Israel. Nebuchadnezzar himself did not go into Israel or Judea. As far as I know, not at this time. He stayed at the, the border town, and then the captives were brought out. And then he met with them there and judged them. And um, apparently many of them did fall by the sword. Okay. And this is something that Ezekiel just saw through the Spirit. Again, he wasn't there necessarily to witness that. Verse 12. And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. Well, the nations that are around you. I think in another translation it says all manner of heathen around you. Um, but you got to remember, in those days, God's people was Israel, you know. Uh, there may have been a few others that had faith, but for the most part, it was Israel. Israel was the chosen nation. And then all the other nations were the, the heathens, you know, the pagans, the, the various cultures. And Israel was supposed to be separate, to stay separate, to touch nothing that is unclean, to come out and be separate. Um, and to be, a, you know, to be... Well, to be sanctified, set apart for the Lord, and not to be uh, watered down by these pagan nations. Um, and again, we are faced with the same thing today, aren't we? Because in um, society now, now God's people, you know, it's anyone who puts their faith in Jesus. Now the, the Messiah has come. Jesus Christ has come. So... Um, the Christians are God's children, God's people. And, but we are surrounded by a horrible influence from the world. And uh, it's, it's pagan, it's uh, heathen, it's all that. And I mean, 
How many times have you heard it? You know, their attitude is just that the Bible is just old fashioned, it's irrelevant, the times have changed. Well, I mean, it is 2016 now, but that doesn't mean the Bible is irrelevant. It's, it's, it's relevant today as it ever has been. It will always be relevant. This is the Word of God. Um, but just, um, you know, it's talking about in, in uh, verse 12. Uh, for you have not walked according to my statutes, nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. Uh, I mean, even Christians today, don't they often act very much like the world around them? And would you know if someone was a Christian just by uh, looking at them or talking with them? Or, or would they just blend in with everyone else? I mean... We have to make the decision, where is the dividing line? And if our dividing line if, is to, to be obedient to God, to the Word of God, that alone, I mean, that makes us different, very different from the world. And, um, but that's what God requires from us. He wants us to be different, wants us to be sanctified, to be set apart from the world. And that happens through obedience to the Word. In, uh, in verse 13, it says, uh, And it came to pass while I was prophesying that Peleteth, the son of Benea, died. Okay, and then I fell down on my face and cried out with a loud voice and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you make a full end of the remnant of Israel? So he was prophesying, and um, somebody that was listening fell over and died <laughs> that's strong preaching right there isn't it uh, yes yes it is um, <laughs> similar thing ha happened in the New Testament uh, was it was it uh, Paul that was preaching and someone uh, fell asleep and then fell off the roof or something and what died I, I don't remember I, I gotta look at it. I gotta look at it again. I mean, as much as I study the Bible, you still gotta keep. You you're never gonna know everything. You can't remember everything. Still gotta look things up to verify facts, fact checking, and all that. But let's get back uh, back on track. Verse. Okay, let's go on down to the next section. Uh, from verse 14. Israel's new heart and spirit. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, your brothers, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them, all of those whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, go far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I remove them from far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary for them for a while in the countries where they have gone. So, let's stop right there. Verse 16. Um, it says, uh, Though I have removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, Yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Think about Israel. Now Israel, Israel lost its homeland and for over 2,000 years. And it was something almost like 2,500 years. 2,400 something, if memory serves correctly. With no homeland. Scattered throughout the nations. And yet... God was a sanctuary to them. He says, uh, Yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. God protected Israel in the countries that they had gone to and preserved them for over 2,000 years um, and then brought them back to Israel. In verse uh, 17, Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from 
from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. There it is. God just said it plain as, plain as day right there. In verses 16 and 17. First he was saying that they have been scattered among the countries yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. And then he says... God says that he will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered. And, and I will give you the land of Israel. Amazing. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, after some 2,000 something years, Israel got their nation back. In um, May 14th, 1948, Israel regained its independence and it got its homeland back. And we talked about that last week also, the amazing prophecy in Ezekiel 4. It was Ezekiel 4, I think, and um, where it was um, his street theater prophecies, where you could actually calculate the exact year, May 14th, or, or you could, the exact year of 1948, when Israel would get their homeland back, which is incredible. And now... God just says it again, even more clear that they've been scattered, but they will be protected in the countries where they've gone. And then God will uh, gather you and assemble you back and will give you the land of Israel. So it's specific. It is the land of Israel. This that is your land and you're getting it back. I mean, um, now, no other ethnic group has lasted for more than five generations without a homeland. And um, here we are talking to Jews scattered for over 2,000 years, and they still maintain their, their national identity and their ethnicity, which is, which is a work of God. It's a miracle. And it's just what he said. God was protecting them. Now, in a... Verse 18, 19. And when you and when they come here, or excuse me, and when they come there, they will, re will remove from it all of its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit, and I will put within them. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So I really like this um, part, this part about... Um, where God says, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and I give them a heart of flesh. I really like that. And um, I had forgotten that that was in Ezekiel, but now studying it, I realized that that's where it is. Um, now, what is he talking about here? You know what? He's talking about the heart of stone is yeah it's the natural heart the heart is desperately wicked um and uh, that is our that is the way we are but god does an, a, a supernatural amazing work in us god does the work in us that we could not do we could not take our stony heart and do any anything with it we couldn't turn it into a heart of flesh but god can the things that are impossible for man are possible with God. And when he's talking about, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. What is the new spirit God will put within them? It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will literally live inside of believers in Jesus. So, um... This is what he's talking about. In Christ, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Okay? And um, so it's the work of the Holy Spirit indwelling in those who put their faith in Jesus. So in some sense, he's talking not just about the nation Israel coming back to their homeland. 
though he is talking about that. But he's talking about more than just that. He's talking also about spiritual Israel, true Israel. Okay? There's a difference between being Israel by birth or being Israel by faith in God. And that faith in God is through Jesus Christ now that the Messiah Jesus has come. So, uh, so true Israel now is those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And um, in, in verse 20, in verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So what is the, the, what is the end result? Well, I say the end result. What is, this is one of the results. One of the end results of all of this. The, the result of all of this. The result of God's activity in our, in our lives. God transforming us from the inside out. Taking out our heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh by the work of the Holy Spirit. Indwelling the Holy Spirit inside of us forever and what does that do it produces obedience in us obedience to God okay that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them that's how important it is to God that we keep these rules that we walk in these statutes and you know what the obeying the Bible that's something that we should want to do but it's something that we also are prone to fail, you know, at, in our own strength, in our own effort. But our willingness, our desire to, to obey God and our desire to please God and follow him and putting our faith in Jesus, that results in the Holy Spirit living in us and that heart of flesh being put inside of us. So the transformation from the inside out, God changes our desires which will then change our our actions on the outside. You know, it's from what's inside that pours to the outside. And so we begin to to be obedient to these to the word because that's the desire of our heart when we have a heart of flesh, which is a heart that has been transformed by the Holy Spirit, transformed by having faith in Jesus Christ. And um and then when it says, when they shall be my people and I will be their God, they're talking, God is talking about fellowship with us. It's a relationship. You know, it's not just a rule book to follow, but it is a relationship. We point out how important it is to God that we follow these rules, that we, we obey him and follow his rules. That's important. It's important to God and it should be important to us. But, uh, but what it is is that we will be his people and God and, and I will be their God. Um, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's a relationship. And, um, and it's, a, it's possible through the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. And, um, you know, if children and heirs... We, we can call God Abba Father. That was the, that was the term Jesus used when he prayed. And it's a father-child-like relationship that we have with God. So, and uh, you know what? In verse 21, but, but as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. And, and onward. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of God, the God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in the vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to the exiles. Then the vision that I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. Um, now, 
you know what? We're talking about the, the obedience that God wants. And, you know, Jesus is perfect. Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. And that's because Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's both. He has two natures. But he is God. Jesus is God. And, uh, and we're not. So we're not able to live perfectly obedient lives like that. But, um, you know, but the desire of our heart is to to please God and is to be obedient. That's what we want. When we fail, we feel bad, don't we? We're talking about Christians. This is the way Christians feel. We have a conscience. And uh, we desire to know God. We delight in the things of, of God. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. And um, But again, our obedience is not expected to be perfect. It's not. Um, God knows that none of us can be perfect. But God cares that we are trying. He cares about the desire of our hearts. And again, He's the one who changes our heart. He's the one who takes out the heart of stone and puts in the heart of flesh. So it's really just about a willingness, a willingness to accept Jesus. If you will if your will is to accept Jesus to put your faith in Jesus and that's your decision then God will honor that and will make these changes take take place in you so don't don't worry don't freak out if you still find yourself slipping up and failing um, it doesn't mean that God has given up on you. Don't think that. If you have faith in Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, then you are saved. You have eternal life. You have passed from death to life. And um, you cannot lose that. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Okay, You're marked by, the, sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You will not lose your salvation. But we do struggle along the way. And, uh, but that's normal. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. God loves you, and He, he just uh, he wants you to grow, you know. And we're faced with these, these hard times that we struggle with, these mistakes and failures at times, but we're expected to grow and to feel how much God loves us. And it's not, it doesn't have to do with our performance because Christ has already performed for us. He lived the perfect, perfect, sinless life for us. And he chose to die on the cross to, as a sacrifice, as the sacrifice for our sins. And he's the one giving us eternal life. He's giving us this gift of salvation to where all we have to do is make the decision to put our faith in Jesus. And that is it. And then we will be grafted in to the family of God. And uh, when at the judgment, we're not judged according our, to our sins. All of our sins are wiped away, washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, God can look at us and He sees Jesus, literally sees Him because of the Holy Spirit living in us. It's the life of Jesus Christ manifest in us. So that is very encouraging. And then, um, you know, as we close it up, you know, Ezekiel is a tough book, okay? There's no way around it. It is just a tough book. It's heavy-handed. It's the, the, you know, the writing style is, is tough. And, but at any rate, I mean, it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff to study prophecies and things like that. But when you look at... Um, let me just show you a couple of New Testament verses that sprang to mind as I was studying through Ezekiel. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith uh, who are the sons of Abraham. Say again. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, 
In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So I point this out that it's faith. You know, it's faith in God. It's faith in the gospel that makes us children of God. And it's not, you know, it's not that you're born an Israelite. There's Israel, the nation, and then there's true Israel, which is a spiritual Israel, spiritual nation. Okay, there's a difference. And then I uh, also want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Uh, and and uh, there was some stuff also in Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11 dealing with this concept of uh, being grafted in to the to Israel and you know, being true Israel and all that. You can look it up on your own. Romans 9 and Romans 11. Read those for some background. But uh, and again, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know, that's what I, I was thinking about when, when uh, looking at how in Ezekiel 11, how the false teachers, the false prophets rose up to tell the people what they wanted to hear. And then... Uh, in second second Timothy is talking about the time is coming where people will not endure sound teaching so we're talking about teaching now rather than prophecy but it's very similar but people will just um, with itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and uh, we're seeing we're definitely seeing that today a lot and um, a lot of churches are not teaching the, the truth anymore which is a sad thing. Um, and sometimes the truth hurts, you know. Uh, Jeremiah was thrown in, in prison for preaching the truth. Um, wasn't he? He sure was. But that that's, that's our ministry. Fulfill your ministry and uh, endure the suffering. Okay, let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for this message. It was... Uh, Something a little different maybe, but the word is always full of new surprises for us. And uh, just help us to make sense of it all and to learn from it and to put the pieces together. And help us to, uh, you know, to be obedient to you. And we need you for that, God. So please take out the heart of stone and give us the heart of flesh. Put your spirit in us. Seal us with the Holy Spirit. And... Um, Change us from the inside out and let us really put our faith in Jesus Christ and uh, let that result in a transformed life. And let us, uh, let us endure suffering and uh, to be sober-minded and let us fulfill our ministry. Let us stand for truth and uh, just let us be just a beacon of hope and light, you know, and light and salt to this world. Um, let us not be led astray by the world, but keep us safe and uh, in the spirit. And let us let us be filled with truth and love and uh, let us speak the truth. Let us do the work of an evangelist and fulfill our ministry and give us your protection and forgiveness. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.